All right, here we go. Hello, everyone, and thank you for uh, watching this program on diagnosing cervical and lumbar radiculopathy. There's no audio taping or videotaping in any unauthorized reproduction, dispensing, forwarding, or copying of this target coding presentation is illegal. Now, the information contained in this presentation is for educational purposes. It is not a substitute for your thorough clinical decision making. Do not apply the information that I am presenting to you to or automatically to your patients. The information should not be construed as written policy for any organization or federal agency. This information is not intended to be. It's not legal advice. Target coding does not not engage in providing legal services. We're not a clinical entity. We're not telling you how to treat patients. This is just for educational purposes. If we talk about CPT codes, CPT is a registered trademark of the AMA. Every attempt has been made certain to uh, make certain that the information in this presentation is 100% accurate. However, it is not guaranteed. A little bit about myself before we get started. My name is Dr. Marty Kotler. I'm a chiropractor, practiced for many years, and about 12 years ago, I started a company called Target Coding. I became certified in CPT coding. I'm a certified professional compliance officer. I've written many books on chiropractic billing, coding, and documentation. My areas of expertise are in E&M coding, that's evaluation and management coding, HIPAA compliance, documentation, billing, and pairing of ICD-10 and CPT codes. I write articles for chiropractic economics and dynamic chiropractic. I'm a featured speaker for the Coding Institute, Parker Seminars, Foot Levelers, and I'm a guest speaker at many national and state chiropractic association conventions nationwide. So because I've had the experience of being in clinical practice, it's a, it's a unique situation being in the trenches, treating patients, being a chiropractor, treating thousands of patients with radiculopathies and other types of conditions and then becoming certified in CPT coding and in um, you know um, an industry leader in teaching chiropractors nationwide and staff members about billing coding and documentation I am attempting to blend the two together being in practice and now understanding what insurance companies want what state boards are looking for what malpractice cases are looking for I'm putting the two together here and sharing this information with you to do a couple of things one be able to treat patients better and number two to maximize reimbursement and get paid what you deserve to be paid so let's begin uh, with some of the key points of diagnosing radiculopathies to begin with radiculopathy is caused by compression or irritation of a nerve as it exits the spinal column the common symptoms include pain numbness tingling weakness in the arms or legs, just to name a few. Now, most patients that present to chiropractic practices with radiculopathy respond very well to chiropractic care. Now, radiculopathies can occur in any part of the spine, but you know the deal. The most common are in the lower back and in the cervical region. Now, what can cause radiculopathy? Well, many things, including disc pathology, like herniations, uh, bulges, prolapses, extrusions, disc degeneration, osteoarthritis, joint problems that include ligament problems, joint laxity, thickening of the ligaments. Now you're going to begin your adventure here as far as diagnosing radiculopathy with a thorough history and examination. So your history is going to include the chief complaint, the HPI, which stands for history of present illness, or in chiropractic college you may have been taught it as the OPQRST. For example, you're going to ask the patient a lot of intense questions like, how did it start? When did it start? 
Is the pain throbbing, burning? Is it worse in the morning? Is it worse at night? What has the patient done for this up until they've come to see you? Have they ever been to a chiropractor? If they have, has it helped? Have they tried physical therapy? Many patients that come to chiropractors, they don't typically go. I mean, at least the, my experience has been that when a patient came to my practice for um, radiating pain down an arm or a leg, I wasn't typically the first health care provider that the patient saw. I was typically more of a last resort for many patients. I'm sure many of you could relate to that. Most patients, um, I would think, um, you know, try medical, uh, you know, services first. You know, patient has radiating pain down an arm or a leg. They'll go to their medical doctor. Medical doctor maybe uh, will prescribe some anti-inflammatories, maybe physical therapy, and the patient tries those things. Then they would come to my practice. Now, some patients try a lot of different things. They may have gone to other chiropractors. They may have tried, you know, TENS machines, acupuncture. They may have even gotten uh, joint injections and nerve blocks, and then they come to you. So your history with a patient with um, a radiculopathy is going to be more intense. It's going to take longer than a simple uh, MSK pain, a simple musculoskeletal pain. And your examination is going to be different when you're looking at a patient with radiating pain versus isolated spinal pain. Now, in order for your services to be considered reasonable, justifiable, health plans, state scope of practice laws, and standard practice acts required your diagnoses to have validity, and they're compatible with your procedure codes, and they can be justified in the documentation. Nowadays, with ICD-10, the documentation is more important than ever. When ICD-10 first came around, most health plans, including Medicare, said, we're going to give providers a one-year grace period. So if they're not using the most specific ICD-10 code for the first year, we're not going to penalize the provider. Well, that grace period is over. So health plans, including Medicare, they're looking at your ICD-10 codes and the justification for the ICD-10 codes you choose more than ever. You know, think about it. I don't know. When I first started practicing, if a patient came in and said, uh, Dr. Kotler, I have low back pain and I have pain radiating down my leg, I automatically diagnosed sciatica or lumbar radiculopathy. I didn't do too many orthopedic, neurological, and chiropractic tests. Why? It was just simpler back then. It was just more standard procedure to do that. Nowadays, if you have a patient come in with radiating pain down an arm or a leg, and you do not do certain ortho-neuro-chiro tests, your claims will be denied. You may have a problem in a malpractice case. Now, remember, when I work with chiropractors on their billing, coding, compliance, I look at things from three different approaches. Number one, yes, to make sure you're going to get paid from a health plan. But what happens if a patient comes in without health insurance? Well, then we have to look at malpractice prevention, risk management, and state board issues. I look at those three things when I am working with a doctor and they're working with a patient. What happens if a patient you know, sues you for malpractice? What happens if the patient files a complaint against you um, with the state board? And, and of course, uh, insurance. And when it comes to insurance reimbursement, we're talking about services that must be medically necessary. When a patient receives health insurance, most insurance plans nowadays cover chiropractic. Within that health plan, it states chiropractic is a covered benefit as long as the services are medically necessary. So in my opinion, medically necessary equates to insurance reimbursable. If a service is not medically necessary, then the service is not payable. Now, it may be clinically indicated and chiropractically necessary, but that doesn't always equate to 
payable. So we have insurance reimbursement. You want to justify the codes with your proper note-taking and pair your diagnosis codes to your CPT codes. If there's a state board issue, for example, one of the most common state board complaints against chiropractors is regarding fees, how much the doctor charges, issues with money and reimbursement. One of the most common reasons why a patient will file a complaint. For example, I had a, a, a doctor I'm working with. The patient was not happy with the care, and the patient said to the doctor, I want my money back. The patient had received a whole bunch of treatments, and the patient said, I'm not better, doctor, and I want my money back. The doctor said, I am not giving you your money back, and then guess what? The patient filed the complaint with the board. The board investigated the situation, asked the doctor for the financial records and the notes. Doctor sends in the information. Board comes back and says, good news and bad news. The good news is you don't have to give the money back to the patient. The bad news is your documentation is not good. And now the doctor is being investigated for poor documentation. And it's a problem because now he's hired me. He's had to get an attorney. The board is really coming down on him very hard because his notes were horrible. So you have to be able to justify the services through proper documentation. ICD-10 is being looked at more closely than ever before. Um, and, you know, the, the road map that many doctors take, uh, you know, you might not be used to the amount of documentation that's required to justify the CPD codes you choose. So hopefully this presentation will ease some of that concern and give you some of the tools to help justify the codes you're using to satisfy any board complaint, risk management situation, and get paid by an insurance company what you deserve to get paid. The clinical rationale for choosing a diagnosis must be in writing. It must be part of your plan of care. It must be entered into the chart notes. So let's go through some of the most common radiculopathy diagnosis codes. So here are a whole bunch of codes you should see on your screen. These are ICD-10 codes with radiculopathy caused by a disc disorder. So M50.1, cervical disc disorder with radiculopathy. I don't recommend you use that one. It's not specific enough. Remember, you always want to code to the highest degree of specificity. That's what the ICD-10 guidelines state. Providers are supposed to code to the highest degree of specificity, not choosing diagnosis codes that, you know, may be there, unspecified, like you see the next one down, M50.10. That cervical disc disorder with radiculopathy unspecified. I don't recommend using unspecified codes. Unspecified codes mean that your documentation cannot support an actual specific code, so you have to use an unspecified code. So I would stay away from M50.1. I would stay away from M50.10. Now we're going to get specific M50.11, cervical disc disorder, with radiculopathy at C2, C3, and C3, C4. Very specific. M50.12, that says cervical disc disorder with radiculopathy mid-cervical. By the way, in a few minutes, I'm going to explain to you what a disc disorder means versus a disc displacement. You will see some diagnosis codes when you're reviewing your ICD-10 list You'll see some say disc disorder and some say disc displacement. I'm going to go over the difference in a few minutes. Now, back to M50.12. I don't recommend you use that one. I've seen it become a problem. I've seen many carriers deny that. Why? Because it's not specific enough. Look at the next one, M50.121. Now we're getting specific. It's at C4, C5. M50.122, cervical disc disorder with radiculopathy, C5, C6. M50.123, that's at C6, C7. And M50.13, that's at the cervical thoracic junction, C7, T1. So these are all cervical disc disorders. Now we're going to get into disc disorders with radiculopathy. 
in the thoracic region and lumbar region. So here we go, M51.14, disc disorder with radiculopathy thoracic. Now, as I mentioned earlier, radiculopathy can occur in any part of the spine, not that common in the thoracic region, and that's where your differential diagnosis um, you know, expertise has to kick in. Again, I am not telling you how to diagnose. I am not telling you how to treat patients. This is an educational presentation. But think back to maybe chiropractic college or maybe you've taken continuing education courses. I have some brilliant clients. I've actually had some of uh, target coding clients help me present at seminars, help assist me with my clients when they have clinical questions. So that differential diagnosis, for example, a patient can come in with, it may appear as though it's a thoracic radiculopathy where the pain is radiating around the rib, following a rib pattern, and you may think, oh, that's thoracic radiculopathy, but the patient has shingles. You know, so remember, you've got to put your differential diagnosis hat on real tight and make sure you're choosing diagnosis codes to the highest degree of specificity and you're choosing the right ones. Hey, if you went to a doctor and you had a particular problem and you were labeled with the wrong or incorrect diagnosis, you wouldn't be happy, right? So you want to choose the most appropriate diagnosis for your patient's condition. M51.15 Disc disorder with radiculopathy, thoracolumbar, 1.6, M51.16, lumbar region, M51.17, disc disorder with radiculopathy, lumbosacral. Now we're going to switch gears. Now we have a whole bunch of codes here that are labeled radiculopathy codes but there's no disc disorder. There's no herniation disc. There's no disc pathology, so to speak. So we have M54.10, radiculopathy, site unspecified. Stay away from that one. M54.11, radiculopathy at the occipito-atlantoaxial level. M54.12, cervical radiculopathy. M54.13, cervicothoracic radiculopathy. 0.14, thoracic. 0.15, thoracolumbar. M54.16, lumbar radiculopathy. M54.17, lumbosacral radiculopathy. M5.18, radiculopathy at the sacral and or sacrococcygeal level. Now, a common question that may be, um, you may be thinking is, is an MRI needed? Is a CAT scan? Is some sort of imaging needed in order to determine a radiculopathy code versus a disc disorder? Now, that's a clinical question. I'm putting on my clinical hat. I'm taking off the Dr. Kotler certified professional compliance officer, expert in coder hat, and I'm putting on my clinical hat. So if I'm asked that question, I would not diagnose a disc disorder or a disc displacement without imaging. That's my personal opinion. I've spoken to many chiropractors over the years where we've gotten into heated discussions or, you know, um, you know, just you know, some good back and forth banter where I have some clients that say, Marty, I do not need an MRI for me to diagnose a herniated disc or I will just use a herniated disc as a working diagnosis or I will diagnose a herniated disc without an MRI because if I uh, treat a patient and I don't do that and then they end up having a herniated disc, I don't want to be accused of causing the herniated disc if there's a problem. You see, so there's some issues here as far as risk management, getting paid by insurance. So that's a nice discussion, nice friendly discussion to have with your advisors, your friends, wherever you share this type of information with your clinical, you know, maybe, you know, I have some clients where they get together once a month 
and they share. They have these, uh, you know, um, you know, little meetings where they run ideas off of each other. Run these ideas off of your friends, you know. So, in my opinion, I would not diagnose a herniated disc without an MRI or a CT scan. That's my opinion. Some of you might want to do that. So, here's some diagnosis codes here on your screen. These are um, radiculopathy codes without disc disorder. M54.10, radiculopathy, sight unspecified, mm, wouldn't use that one. M54.11, radiculopathy, occipital atlantoaxial level. M54.12, cervical. M54.13, cervicothoracic, 0.14, thoracic, 0.15. Thoracolumbar, M54.16, radiculopathy, lumbar region. M54.17, lumbosacral radiculopathy. M54.18, sacral and or sacrococcygeal radiculopathy. Now let's talk a little bit about the difference between disc disorder and disc displacement. There's a quick comparison you should be able to see on your screen. You'll see there are different diagnosis codes. Cervical disc disorder are the M50.1 series. Cervical disc displacement, that's without radiculopathy or myelopathy. Throwing another word in there right now, myelopathy, what's that? We'll get to it in a minute. So cervical disc displacement without radiculopathy, without myelopathy, that's the M50.2 series of codes. So here we have disc disorder and disc displacement. What's the difference? Very important, you should know this. Disc disorder is there's some disc pathology involved here. Bulge, protruded, ruptured, extruded disc with radiculopathy. That means there's nerve root compression. A disc displacement is also disc pathology, herniated bulge, protruded disc, without any type of radiculopathy. There's no nerve root compression. Big difference. So Mrs. Jones comes in. She has brought in an MRI. She says she has pain from her neck radiating into her uh, arm. We're going to use a disc disorder, cervical disc disorder. Next, Mr. Williams comes in. He has neck pain, no radiating pain. He brings in an MRI. It shows herniated disc at C5, C6 or bulge disc at C5, C6. Patient says, I do not have any pain radiating into my arms. There's no myelopathy. We're going to get to that in a second. So that's a disc displacement. So myelopathy, what's that? You know, oftentimes I'll see some of my clients' notes and they'll use a disc disorder with myelopathy. I immediately call the doctor. And I ask the doctor, do you know what myelopathy is? Oftentimes the doctor says, not sure. So, what's the difference between radiculopathy and myelopathy and radiculitis? Radiculitis refers to inflammation of the nerve root. Radiculopathy is that nerve root compression radiating down into an arm or a leg. Myelopathy means that there's spinal cord compression. How can you tell if there's cord compression? Well, typically imaging, some sort of diagnostic test. So if you, by accident, let's say, diagnose a patient with a cervical disc disorder or disc displacement with myelopathy, you're saying that there's cord compression. So whenever I see a doctor that I'm working with use a my, with myelopathy, I usually call the doctor and say, hey, do you have an MRI? Do you have a CT scan? And oftentimes, if there is a CT scan MRI, it says it right in the report, then go ahead and use with myelopathy. Now, that spinal cord compression that occurs with myelopathy, it can cause some advanced neurological deficits. Patients could have some issues with uh, you know, bowel and bladder control. So we have these disc disorders, we have disc displacements, we have radiculopathy codes, but we also have some other codes like sciatica is a type of radicular pain, correct? 
So I wanted to share these sciatica codes with you. M54.3 is sciatica. I don't recommend you use that. Remember, when you're diagnosing, you have to use codes to the highest degree of specificity. If you use M54.3, or even the next one, M54.30, I would have a, a good guess that your claim would not get paid because it's not specific enough. If the patient has sciatica, is it right side or left side, or both sides? So, if you're creating cheat sheets, quick guides, like a favorite list is what some people call it, don't include M54.3 or M54.30 on your list. Go right to the M5431 sciatica right side, 32 left side. How about this? In ICD-10, there's a few combo codes that were created. Here's one example. See, in ICD-9, remember that back in the day, ICD-9, um, if the patient had low back pain and sciatica, you had to use two codes. In ICD-10, there's a combination here, low back pain with sciatica, M54.4. That's nice. However, don't use that one. Don't use M54.40, that's unspecified. So, patient has low back pain with sciatica on the right side, there you go, M54.41. Left side, M54.42. Now, there's also something called pairing. You know, there's um, all these different terms when it comes to um, diagnosing highest degree of specificity, um, all these different terms, but there's another term called pairing. Your pairing of your codes are more important now than ever before because of the scrutiny that's placed on. And where you, as you know, as I'm describing here, when you're coming up with a diagnosis, you must be able to support it. I'm going to give you some specific examples in a couple of minutes on how to support your diagnosis code. And the same thing when it comes to your CPT codes, you must be able to justify it. For example, if you're going to use, let's say, traction, mechanical traction, that's CPT code 97012, why would you use that? You know, you may be questioned by a health plan, a, a malpractice case, a state board complaint. Hey, Dr. Kotler, we see that you're using mechanical traction on this patient. Why? What's the clinical rationale for traction? you should have a good answer. Like, we use traction to separate and stretch the spinal segments. We use it to increase joint hydration. You know, there's some really good key terms. Another example, therapeutic exercises, that's 97110. So if you ever question, hey, Dr. Kotler, why are you using therapeutic exercises on this patient? Well, here's a good answer. We're using therapeutic exercises to improve range of motion, improve flexibility, improve strength. So if you're billing 97110 to improve range of motion, what should your documentation show that the patient has a lack of? Yeah, range of motion. If the patient has full range of motion, full strength, why would you use therapeutic exercises. You see, these are the things that I'm sharing with you to help justify your CPD codes, your diagnosis codes. This way you could SWAN. I don't know if you've ever heard that acronym SWAN, S-W-A-N, providing you with this information so you could SWAN, which means sleep well at night. So here's an example. You diagnose a patient with myofascial pain syndrome. That's M79.1. Well, that pairs beautifully with manual therapy, 97140. I look at this pairing like, like, you know, pairing food with wine, you know, red meat with red wine and fish with white wine. Pair your ICD-10s to your CPTs as best as you can. Now, the justification in your documentation, this is one of the most important parts of this presentation. For example, a patient comes in with cervical radiculopathy and you're going to use one of the diagnosis codes that I just shared with you, the M50 series of codes, say M50.122. So cervical radiculopathy, let's say it's at C4, C5, C5, C6, and your question, hey, Dr. Kotler, we see that you diagnosed a patient with 
cervical radiculopathy at C5, C6. Can you explain how did you come up with that? What did you do to justify that? So here you go. A good answer would be, now this could be, again, malpractice case, state board issue, insurance company, what did you do? Well, the patient came in with neck pain and pain radiating into uh, an extremity, an upper extremity, right side or left side. The patient's had some numbness and tingling. I did some orthopedic tests. Well, which ortho tests did you do, Dr. Kotler, to help justify this? Well, I did a little Jackson compression, spurling, shoulder depression, Valsalva. You don't have to do all of these. Again, put your clinical hat on and you decide how many of these ortho tests do you think would be enough? I would say two or three of these would be nice. Range of motion. Okay, what else did you do, Doc? Well, I did some neurological tests. I checked reflexes. I checked for dermatome changes. I checked for myotomal weakness. I did some positive nerve stretch tests. Okay, Dr. Kotler, what else did you do? Well, from my chiropractic evaluation, I found subluxation, I found palpatory tenderness, I found fixation, hypomobility, limited motion. What else did you do, Dr. Kotler? Well, um, the patient was uh, treated with uh, conservative care, and uh, after six, eight visits, the patient just was not responding as well as I thought, so I recommended some diagnostic tests. When a patient is coming to you after seeing many other providers, they probably are going to walk in with their MRIs or CT scans. Okay, so there's a great example on how to justify cervical. How about lumbar? So Mrs. Jones comes in. She has pain in her lower back. It's radiating down her right leg. Dr. Kotler, we see that you diagnosed this patient with lumbar disc disorder with radiculopathy without myelopathy. So how did you come up with that, Dr. Kotler? Well, here's some good responses. Mrs. Jones came and she had low back pain. She had pain radiating into her right buttock. She had a little tingling in her legs. I did some muscle tests and she has some weakness in her legs. I did Kemp's, Bechteru straight leg raise, braggards. Now, these ortho tests, you might be thinking, wow, I haven't seen those um, since I graduated a chiropractic college 12 years ago. Very easy to go to YouTube, type in Trendelenburg, Bell, the slump test, type in a few of these and you'll get beautiful quick videos on how to do these on patients. Dejarine's triad, Valsalva, Antalgic Lean. What neuro test did you do, Dr. Kotler? Well, I checked for motor weakness. I checked reflexes, dermatome changes, any chiro tests? Sure. I checked for subluxations, segmental dysfunction, fixation, palpatory tenderness, limited motion. And we have an EMG, possibly NCV, X-ray, CT, MRI. Alrighty, so just a few closing comments. Please check with all the carriers you bill prior to submitting claims based on this information to ensure that's compliant. Can't guarantee that this information will guarantee payment from any health plan or patient. Target coding is not responsible for any laws, rules that may change following this presentation and you know they change all the time. So do your best to stay on top of these changes by attending webinars and seminars and joining your national and state professional associations. Here's our contact information. Email info at targetcoding.com. Website targetcoding.com. Telephone number 1-800-270-7044. Our HIPAA secure fax number is 1-844-831-2347. Now, just a couple of things before we get to questions. There is a book that I recommend. It's the book on the best ICD-10 and CPT codes to, re, uh, to improve reimbursement. And here's, yeah, I like the little tagline there. Learning how to bill and code isn't expensive, but neglecting it and defending it, yes, that could be expensive. So 
This is an excellent book to have part of your library. There's great resources in here. Like I had mentioned earlier, what ortho neuro chiro test should you use for cervical radiculopathy? But we have a whole there's there's a whole bunch of others here in this book, like for cervical sprain, cervical strain, um, cervical brachial syndrome. We have them for um, impingement syndrome, rotator cuff, um, cervical brachial syndrome, cervical cranial syndrome. There's a whole bunch of these um, clinical examples in uh, in this book, and then there's also these uh, you know cheat sheets, little quick guides that show you the long-term treatment diagnosis codes, uh, moderate-term treatment, short-term treatment diagnosis codes. Like, just think about it like this: if a patient comes in with sciatica and muscle spasm, and you had to report one code to a health plan. Which one would you pick? Sciatica. Why? Because it paints a better picture and you'll get paid for more visits for sciatica than simple muscle spasm. There's also a chapter in this book, there's FAQs, like what's the difference between effusion, swelling, and edema? What's the difference between idiopathic scoliosis and thoracogenic scoliosis? What's the difference between spasm and contracture? What's the difference between myalgia, myositis, and myofasciitis? Oh, and there's another nice section of the book where it shows you how to pair your procedure codes. For example, there's therapeutic exercises on your screen now, and it gives you the verbiage. You know, there's a great acronym. It's called SERF, S-E-R-F. If you're doing therapeutic exercises, accomplish one of those four parameters. S stands for strength, E stands for endurance, R range of motion, F flexibility, there's the verbiage, and then there's all the diagnosis codes that link or match or pair or combine, whatever term you want to use with therapeutic exercises. There they are in the cervical region, we have them for thoracic, lumbar. <clears throat> oh, also, switching gears a little bit, um, Target Coding now offers OIG compliance manuals. OIG compliance manuals are mandatory, not optional. If you're seeing Medicare, Medicaid, any federally funded program patient, you must have an OIG compliance manual. It's not complicated. It's pretty straightforward. It's a book of policies and procedures. You need to do some self-audits. So this compliance program that we offer comes with chart audit tools, po policies and procedures for your practice about, you know, um, what do you do if, um, you know, if to train your staff on how to prevent billing and coding errors. For example, mm, um, if you're ever asked, so Dr. Kotler, what action steps do you take to prevent billing and coding errors? Yeah, you could say, well, I, I go to seminars, that's not enough. Um, I, I learned a lot of good things in chiropractic college. Not enough. You want to be able to say, oh, I have policies, procedures, written policies and procedures. We train our staff on these items. We do self-audits. There's a chart audit tool. It's a quick checklist that you go down. So we offer that. Those of you that um, are not HIPAA compliant, um, HIPAA is um, mandatory. Um, now, this is even if you see cash patients. Um, you don't have to see Medicare patients in order to um, be HIPAA compliant. You must be HIPAA compliant. Another one of these items where, you know, these are just the laws. You know, you need to know the law, right, in order to know if you're following it or breaking it. You know, it's just one of these things like sitting in traffic. It's not something you want to do. It's just something that's part of life. Um, do you want to have to have a HIPAA program in place? No, but it's mandatory. You just have to do it so you could, what? Swan, sleep well at night. So we offer HIPAA compliance. Now, you're not HIPAA compliant unless you do a security risk analysis and have written policies and procedures. Unfortunately, 99% of the chiropractors that I interact with are not HIPAA compliant. Now, not being HIPAA compliant doesn't mean you're talking really loud in the waiting room and you have charts left out all over the place. 
there's more to it than not being HIPAA compliant. Again, HIPAA compliance means you've done a full security risk assessment on your practice, you have written policies and procedures, and you document them in a binder. So we offer a HIPAA compliance program. We also do seminars and webinars all over the country, our seminars. We offer memberships, basic membership. Hey, you want to just sign up for one month? Yeah, you could go for this program. Very nice, $99, pay as you go. We have a gold membership. This includes a comprehensive review of your CPD codes, diagnosis codes, SOAP notes, intake forms, HIPAA forms, fee schedules, modifiers, cash plans, and ongoing trainings throughout the year. And you could attend all of our paid seminars and paid webinars for free. And then we also offer a platinum membership. This includes a full day of training at your office. Anyone interested in just chatting with us for about 15 minutes just to run some things by us, pick our brains for 15 minutes. We'll give you as much as we can in that time period, and then you're on your own. So again, here is our contact information, info at targetcoding.com, website targetcoding.com, telephone number 1-800-270-7044 our HIPAA secure fax number is 844-831-2347. I want to thank everybody for attending this presentation. I hope you learned a lot.